Justice, who is going to tell us what a mirror symmetry is. Mark? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, uh, what I'm going to talk about is, um, well, this joint work with Baron Siebert with lots of inputs from a whole bunch of people, including Sean Kiel and Paul Hacking, and uh, John Dix and, and Chen. Uh, and we also going to talk about a very general neurosymmetry construction, hopefully, the, the most general construction. Uh, so, let's focus on, on the law of the outcase that Paul has been. In uh, talking about. So uh, let's fix, for example, the pair, XD, normal crossing square. Uh, and with the property that KX must be is zero. And we might want some additional conditions, such as the maximality that uh, Paul talked about, maximum boundary. Meaning that D has, there's a zero dimensional stratum, some intersection of, if X is n dimensional, there's some intersection of n irreducible compounds, meaning of um, Okay, so this is a, a standard situation. And in particular, um, my joint paper with, with Paul and uh, Sean Keel uh, considered constructed mirrors for these pairs when X is a surface. And there are several basic steps for constructing a mirror, which we might hope to generalize to all dimensions. So, well, first of all, I think step zero is that you have to write down a pretty good guess. I mean, we, we don't want to do S, Y, Z vibrations because we don't know that they exist, but still we can make a good guess as to what the base of the S, Y, Z vibration is. And that means uh, we can write down an integral affine manifold. associated to uh, the pair XD. So in the two-dimensional case, uh, this was uh, done in this joint paper with uh, hacking and heel. Uh, so if uh, XD looks something like this, that's the cycle of the T1s. And then the corresponding B is something that looks like a fan. You know, pretend that this is a torque variety of the fan looks something like that. Uh, except that there's this is not R2, but rather there's some singularity in the atom structure of origin. Okay. So this is kind of a purely common trail gadget that you can associate to this pair. It only depends on the intersection number, self-intersection numbers of the irreducible components. Um, and in fact, you can do that in all dimensions. It's not very hard. Uh, so that's the zero step. Uh, that's easy combinatorial analysis. Does this uh, easy combinatorial step also have a modular interpretation? Uh, so the underlying space uh, B is the same thing that uh, Paul was talking about as so U trough. Uh, so the integral points, which are going to be the most interesting thing, corresponding to, to boundary. So then the, uh, so this really is a trough position. So there's this additional half-line structure, which isn't visible in the dilation picture. Um, OK, so that's the first step. So the second, uh, sorry, the zero step. Uh, the first step is to build a, um, a scattering dart. So I'm going to be very vague in most of this. Then I'm going to get very precise on the last step. Uh, so build a scattering dart. Again, you saw. Some kind of pictures of these things. Uh, so 
So this is sort of a collection of walls on B with functions attached to them, which are going to tell us something about homomorphic disks, or morally something about homomorphic disks on X. And really, this is defined in terms of one point. Essentially, the idea is that you want to count curves of P ones that meet the boundary of one point, so they can be thought of as just affine lines sitting inside X minus D. And um, use those to, to build this scattering diagram. And I say algebra about a geometric replacement for counting homomorphic disks, which I personally find too hard to do. Uh, so from this, so you know, what this looks like typically, again, this is this must be very handwritten discussion at this point. So typically, the scattering diagram looks up. You just have a bunch of rays and two-dimensional case emanating from uh, the origin. And then you use these to glue various standard charts together where the functions attached to the walls tell you um, exactly how you're supposed to glue different charts together. So this is um, uh, you know, very much like what Paul was talking about, where he was gluing the torus charts together. <coughs> But you have to do this infinitesimally formally uh, because uh, there might be an infinite number of rays. You have, have dead set of rays. Uh, anyway, I don't want to go through the details of that. So, but what you do is use these, use this, uh, this scattering diagram to construct uh, an open subset. <laughs> I'll write as x check open, uh, a putative, uh, uh, open subset of the putative <laughs> Now, really what you're missing, so if you, uh, you, you can do this to sort of various orders, so you do it to order zero, in this case you just glue together a bunch of affine planes in the common torus dictated by, by the fan. Uh, and then higher orders will give some thickening. But you have no idea what the local model is near the vertex here. So you just glue together sort of along codimension one, and you leave off this codimension two piece. But the basic idea then, so, so that's step one. Uh, you aren't there yet. But step two is that you now construct a canonical basis But the main point is that this construction tells you that you, this does have a lot of functions. And in particular, this will be flat over, this, this ring will be flat over uh, 
your base ring. And then what you do is you define x hat uh, to get the inspection of this ring. The fact that you have enough functions here will tell you that this is a partial compactation of this. So that has the effect of filling things in in co-dimension two, the Harpon Harpon's fundamental structure. Can you say why did you want an app? How does that, was this the reason you wanted the ability to be app in the first place? Uh, so that's what we expect. Uh, uh, but this is a, is formal. So. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm leaving off a lot of details here. I'm going to get much more precise later, uh, but I wanted to give the impressionist, uh, you know, uh, impressionist picture first. Um, the, the third step, which is not strictly necessary at this point, is you've actually um, you've actually now constructed the mirror. Uh, the third step is that you actually can now write down and describe. If you want to know what this gadget is as a ring, uh, you need to know what the product of two of these theta functions are, and so you need some structural structure constants to describe the multiplication rule, again in terms of tropical data on B. Now, what I'm going to talk about today, uh, so I sort of understood that uh, we can do this in all dimensions, probably in 2012 already, though there are many, many things that can be worked out. Uh, and it would still take a lot of time to explain how you do steps one and steps two. <coughs> we actually reach a point of understanding where we can just skip steps one and two and go directly to step three and fit that in a one hour. Uh, and of course, if you know the structure constants, then you know what the ring is and you can take the step. But nevertheless, we can <coughs> add steps one and two in, in all dimensions also. Okay, so in order to explain how we're going to do this, uh, I have to start by talking about a new kind of Grand Whitman ring, which we call puncture. So this is um, joint work with a Brombich, Chen, Sullivan, Siebert. Uh, this is a new kind of logarithmic drawn with an invariant. And uh, I think the only log geometry expert in the audience is now Oh, no, there you are. Okay. So, I, since I want to give, explain things uh, to a broader audience than just one, I will skip the law of geometry um, and just give an intuition as to what, uh, what these do for us. Uh, so, this is a kind of uh, slight generalization of law of geometry. Now, the, the mantra is that this allows negative contact order. Put that in quotes. And let me try to explain what this means in a relatively simple situation. So suppose that you have the case of relative growing with invariance. Uh, where we just have a smooth divisor sitting inside by a smooth variety. So, let's say e a smooth divisor. We have uh, the notion of relative drum with invariance, which dates from uh, around the turn of the millennium. Uh, the idea of relative drum with invariance is you want to count curves in X but curves where you have marked points with specified order of tangency with the divisor D. And we're not allowed to interact with D if, or 
officially we're not allowed to direct the B if uh, the point is not marked. So if you know, can't have a picture return it be a, a non-marked point. Uh, every interaction with D is controlled by marked points with given order chances. Now, you know, if you have a curve like I've just drawn that uh, just needs to be a finite number of points, it's obvious how to define it. You just need to pull back a uh, uh, local equation for D and uh, look at its order of zero uh, uh, the long, uh, at, at the marked point, and that gives you the order of tangency. But the basic impediment to defining relative growing width invariance is you need growing with compactness. So it's quite possible that you might have a family of such curves where the limit curve falls into D. Uh, so, there's a question problem in the beginning of compactness. Each allow components of C to fall into the And the suggestion uh, that came out of the early work, especially Jun Lee's work, is to use what's known as expanded degenerations. Uh, so, uh, you know, normally in your Witten theory, you bubble off uh, components of the domain, uh, but here you also have to bubble off a piece of the target space. So, the typical picture, the expanded degeneration picture, is that you have to attach, and here's D, here's X, you attach. A P1 bubble over D to D to get a, a reducible target space. This P1 bundle is the projectivization of OD plus the normal bundle of D in X. And then, uh, if you have, say, a, a sequence of curves whose limit actually falls entirely inside of D, what happens <coughs> after you do uh, you, uh, attach this is that now you're allowed to consider target uh, uh, curves that meet that fall into entirely into this divisor, uh, this, sorry, this irreducible component of the target, uh, and now you still have the, you still have this um, mark point here, and this curve here, the, the section infinity of this projective bundle, uh, is playing the role of the new divisor. So you still have uh, the same kind of order of tangency, but what the divisor is, has changed. So uh, this, does make sort of very technically complicated uh, theory because you have now have to deal with the target space changing as well as the domain. Uh, the whole point of logarithmic growing width invariance is that it actually takes care of all these things with, with no real problems. And in particular, you don't have to uh, you don't have to do solving off the target space. Uh, but I'm not going to explain that. Uh, that would be a different talk. So. Rather, what does negative order of tangency mean? So, you know, in this case over here, uh, the if this is the curve C, C dot D should be equal to the total, the sum of the orders of contact orders of the marked points. So C dot D should be equal to the number of well, the sum of the let's say U D I, where Pi to mark points mark points of C with contact order UPI, so some kind of general positive or non negative number, you can have contact order zero in the same action mark point doesn't interact with D at all. But you anyway should have C dot D is, is the sum in order to have any chance of working out. Now if we say just at one mark point, and now we ask, well, what about allowing a negative order tangency? Well, that would mean C dot D is negative, and the only way that can happen is if C is contained. Uh, so again, if you want to understand uh, what that means from the expanded degeneration picture, uh, then we should again uh, do this thing, but let me draw a different curve here. Uh, so here is a curve in the expanded degeneration picture, which we will interpret as having negative order of tangency with D. 
if you want, you can think of this, uh, the curve sitting inside of D is really being given by section of the normal bundle, or maybe the co-normal bundle um, of, the, of the pullback of the, the or sorry, the pullback of the normal bundle of D uh, to, um, to the curve. And in the ordinary situation where we're asking for positive orders of tangency, we just allow zeros of that section of the appropriate orders. But now we're going to allow the whole as well. So I don't know if that makes any sense, but uh, that's the most efficient way I have of uh, giving a uh, ad hoc, uh, giving a, a rough idea as to what the uh, function invariants are without actually getting our hands very dirty with uh, bottom instructions. So is, is there any way of uh, describing this thing again, like completely in the world of symplectic geometry, was there something about what happened to the variable of it? Uh, I, I would like to uh, answer that. We have uh, Mohammed answer Well, that. I mean, my understanding, this is a translation of what yeah. occurs in symplectic geometry. Yeah, at a, at a certain level, but uh, yeah, there are some things I would like to understand better. And so yeah. I'll ask it, 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 it took many years to get this word. translation, and then by the time they translated it, we couldn't understand what they were doing anymore. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so is there, what is negative contact? Is it output? Yeah, that's right. So this, this is output. Okay. So, so now I think I'm in dangerous territory here, right? This is. Oh, well, yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, the, the point is that there exists. So here's. Vague theorem because I haven't really defined anything in here. Uh, there exists an authorized space of uh, stable log maps with what we call punctures, i.e., points with negative orders of tangency. Remember, I'm actually in a much more general situation. I'm not just considering a single smooth divisor. D is an all crossing divisor. Uh, and this multi space has a uh, relative, a perfect relative obstruction theory. Over an Arden stack, I won't tell you what it is. So that's you know, generally a good situation to be in if we want to define invariance. But there's one little hitch here, which is this Arden stack is not necessarily equidimensional. Or not. I, have not, I haven't really understood this very well. So what this means is there's not a canonical choice of the virtual fundamental class. So, so it means yes. that you have some co component, so that sum is 2 is completely yeah. random divided. That's right, yeah. So yeah. Then, then it makes different dimensions. Yeah, okay. So, but so it, it's some kind of intersecting component of 2. Uh, you have a, your, your, your space is morally, it's a union of finite many uh, uh, some complex molecules. Mm -hmm. So that uh, each, each has, has a different dimension. And they intersect on right, right. But, 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 they, but those different dimensions, dimensions, dimensions can be different. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so, so kind of, you can just restrict each right. of the strata. It has a kind of vertical dimension. Yeah. 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 So that that kind of thing we, we can imagine. But okay. it, to prove it's a different thing. Okay. <laughs> but this, this is so when you say relative obstruction, relative to what? Uh, well, relative I didn't want to tell you what the stack is. It's, okay. it's a very complicated object. Okay. To write down. But you know, essentially the reason is, is that there are combinatorial obstructions to deforming, which you can't realize as a, as a cohomology. So you have to put it in by hand uh, in this argument stack. Can I imagine this argument stack is like recording somehow the combinatorics of the curves? That Absolutely. That could like, be just, yeah. Uh, things like you have a perfect structure in each 
Uh, yeah, the, that's not necessarily such the right thing. And the, the expected dimension changes time by time? Oh, yeah. Great, right, so the, uh, the, the, the modular space is defined over the total stack, and the stack is not every dimensional, and the fibers aren't every dimensional? Or? Uh, well, you know, the dimension of fiber is sort of irrelevant. So well, I mean, the dimension uh, of the, uh, the, 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 the virtual the dimension. dimension. Yeah, virtual dimension. That's not constant. Okay. So the stack is RT because uh, you have some C stack which is related to this, uh, yeah. and then that might have a fixed point. Yeah. Yeah. It, it will. This is a. Yeah. This is is a whole topic. But can you repeat that? So is it true that the equidimensional strata correspond to a fixed, say, dual graph of the curves that you're mapping? Uh, so there is a relationship. It's it's it's. Fairly close to that, yeah. It's this type of combinatorial yeah, data. Right, yeah. yeah, okay. So, you know, the moral is that you do have to be careful when, when you want numbers, and in every case that you actually want a number, you have to make sure you're, I mean, you can pull back cycles from this. And the whole point of the positive structure there means you can pull back cycles from this, but there's just something phenomenal to pull back. So every time you do want to define something, you have to be careful. Okay, so um, anyway, this this is uh, in a paper that my my collaborators have at the moment uh, after I uh, wrote the latest version. So you know, there's some chance it'll appear soon. Um, okay, so so that's the the background we need. So now I want to go on. So as I say, directly to the three. Now I actually uh, I. I should mention that I uh, only sort of start realizing that three was something that we knew how to do directly without going through the earlier steps after a conversation with Daniel Milano. Mm -hmm. Is uh, I think the shield uh, is working with uh, uh, trying to get some algebraic geometric uh, interpretations for the zero syntax homology group, and uh, it turned out that this was sort of exactly these kind of variants are exactly the things that, that you want to think about. Um, so I, so I owe a lot in sort of the simplicity of the construction to, to those discussions. Uh, okay, so let's now actually, if you accept this, accept that there might be some numbers we can extract, I can now tell you exactly what we do. So now let's fix, fix any pair at D, so D is, uh, say, some of the sort of the school components. And just to keep life simple, let's assume that um, all strata are connected, so di0 intersect dip, assuming uh, that but this is still not a process. Uh, assume di0 is <laughs> any intersection of, of components is connected. Then I can write down the uh, the thing that we're going to call B, um, build with an affine structure, as the dual intersection complex of this uh, this divisor. So the way we do this is the easiest way to think about this is um, let's consider the all right. This is D of D of X. This is a the subgroup of the divisor group of X generated. So let this be a subgroup. Generated by the DIs. And then I'll write div dx dual with the subscript r, meaning I tensor with r and then I take the dual. That is the dual vector space of r. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
doesn't hurt right now. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> It's good to have students come up there. You have one cone for each non-trivial stratum. Uh, and then we take B to be just the union of all tau and B to B. Okay, so this just records how all these different divisors intersect and nothing more. We can worry about uh, uh, any atom structure of this. And then we have B to Z, is just B intersect. Uh, So those points should index the, uh, the basis of the gill for a ring. <coughs> okay, so we're going to fix a bit of extra data. So fix a uh, finally generated saturated Submonide uh, T containing the second homology of X um, such that, well, two things. First of all, P and the second minus P should be contained in the torsion part of the homology group. And secondly, it should contain the class of every effective. Let's define uh, the ring AI, which will be the monoid ring K graph of P. We're working over some uh, field K, uh, same field that X is defined over and we divide out by the monoid I. Uh, this is our substitute for the no uh, um, Generated by the points of B of Z. So uh, we sum all P and B of 
Z AI times a symbol beta P, thinking of those as all theta functions. So in particular, we need to describe uh, Structure coefficients of beta p times beta q is equal to summation over all r z uh, alpha p q r uh, beta s r, where these coefficients should be in the ground ring alpha p q r a i. Okay, so this is our goal. If we want to find a ring, this is what we need to do. So we're going to find the structure constants. And uh, teasing this apart a bit more. Yeah, just like, yeah. Yeah. At, at the philosophical level, in the constructive jump talks, they always allow Nova covering, which contains, I would say, um, disks of arbitrary size. And here in this algebraic jump, you said we only allow the integral size. That's right. So, so why is that okay? okay. And of course, you only need the integral size disks in algebraic jump. But what, I mean. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, one. So the one way to think about it is that what we're really doing, in some sense, is choosing integral, so an actual divisor on the initial space, on, on xd. And that's what's going to tell us that the mirror we construct is actually an algebraic object rather than something, say, non uh, That's probably the choice. But in fact, what we're doing, what we're really choosing, I mean, we're not making the choice of that actual divisor, we're really just working with the whole So uh, then finally, um, I can write it. So alpha p q r, I can break it down. So this is an element of this, uh, this monomial ring, of this, uh, this monomial ring. So I'll write this as summation over beta ranging in um, uh, over uh, elements of p minus i of some coefficient in beta p q r. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what these numbers are supposed to be. Okay, so just a little bit more. So one thing is note that uh, P, if you choose a point P in P of Z, this specifies a stratum of X. Which I'll write as Z P. So this will be an intersection over all i such that p value on di is greater than zero. Remember, these points p are elements of the dual vector space I can evaluate on di, and I take the intersection on di. I took my hands off before I got down there. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, consider a moduli space space of genus 
zero. Uh, punctured maps in the sense that I struck over there uh, with uh, of class beta. All that uh, beta is put in here, so the image, the, the, the class, the, the, the map represents the homology of class beta. Uh, class beta uh, with three mark points. Let me call the mark point XP, XQ, and XR. And now I want to impose some tangency conditions, uh, contact conditions uh, on those three points. So XP is tangent. <coughs> I, the order D e of D I, remember that these points are in dual space, and similarly X Q is tangent to D I, the order Q of D I, and now here's the interesting part is R is the output, X R is tangent. to di to order uh, q uh, r of di. And we insist that the point map to z. Okay, so it turns out if you set this up correctly, uh, uh, you do get a situation where you do have a virtual function of class, and uh, you know, it's just a subdimension. Uh, so which one is negative? Is it the sum? Is it the oh, sorry. I, I, yeah, right. I, 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 uh, there's a minus sign. Uh, right, that was the important point I mentioned but didn't say. Okay. Um, yeah, so the point is that we actually can, can define some of these numbers. So, let's give this modified space a name, M, and M carries a virtual fundamental class. And then we define n beta EQR is the integral over n vert of y. So, in other words, we only get an answer if, uh, uh, well, a non zero answer if uh, this is virtual dimension zero. So this is equal to zero if uh, virtual dimension. And if it is virtual dimensions, it's such that it's the degree of virtual final class. So it's a number. Is there a quick way to explain how this works not geometrically? There must be some trick to make it work to me. Uh, you mean what makes the virtual final class? No, the, the negative detection. Uh, no, I mean, that's the thing. So it would take me half an hour. Okay, good. good, good. I, yeah, I don't have to Just to make uh, Martin unhappy, I'll say it involves non fine mob structures. <laughs> so the x, the x p, it belongs to zp and x p belongs to zp? <coughs> uh, yeah, so, so that's, um, yeah, that's, uh, that's forced on us by these tangency conditions. Uh, okay, wait. The, the DIs are taking the ones that uh, that's positive for all of the. That's right, yeah. So, I mean, from, you know, most of these, these will be zero, but when it's non-zero, then the point has to map into that divisor, and so that means that this uh, point X P automatically falls inside Z. Uh, and the same for the other two, but more specifically for the alpha, I, I impose a point condition. Okay, so then uh, you have to show something. 
here in this uh, product session. Now, at a certain level, this is, is completely standard. Uh, when you try your, uh, just like the original uh, WDBV associativity, uh, it's the same argument you look at four pointed uh, curves and break it up in two ways. And the thing that makes it really difficult is that gluing in the log world is really hard. And that's why we're having trouble sort of writing. I mean, it is true. Writing down is hard. It's hard to okay, we'll understand things better. Okay, so th this gives us a you know, in general, uh, so this should be uh, an algebra of geometric analog of SH0 of uh, X minus C. So I've had some conversations with Daniel about um, seeing whether we can sort of push this up to all the conceptual cohomology or some, some ideas being tossed around. I was just going to ask, do you have analogs of these modular spaces where you fix angular conditions um, uh, on... So, so you can fix, so in, in terms of, I mean, maybe we should talk about this after because yeah. it involves stuff that you know that most of the audience doesn't, but uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's, there's some things you can do. Um, Did you say that analog is a cohomology? Yeah. If D, some component is positive, some component is negative, then super cohomology is negative. That's right, yeah. No, but this is always defined. But it's, yeah. It is, we can't compare. It. <laughs> and in particular, in some ways, it's not really the right thing in that case. Uh, the log geometry doesn't work very well for seeing spheres in the bank. You're not seeing it. Right. Sorry, but are you, are you still assuming that the total boundary supports something? I make yeah. no assumption on server. This is just arbitrary there. <laughs> That's why I said that one. <laughs> I'm making no conjecture. Right, so then, um, okay. Not even ma maximal, right? I mean, no, it's completely. A fun example is P2 relative to the uh, smooth one. So that works. Yeah, you, you get a polynomial, right? Mm -hmm. With an interesting problem. So when you say that this is algebra, algebra geometric analog, do you mean that this actually happened in the Hochschul homology of the... the of x minus d, db of x minus d. This is what, I mean, there's nothing more than this. Boltman seems to still exist for this kind of simple geometry. What? Boltman. There are some more general post-Russian simple homology that using only finite of geometry. Oh God, Roman. this is Roman. Roman, Roman. Roman. yeah, yeah, Roman. Uh, that no, doesn't no, exist no. in this scenario. No, no, no. 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 It, it assumes that you have some kind of volume growth at infinity, which if you had uh -huh. Uh -huh. a negative thing, you would I see. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of cases where this product is completely trivial because of dimension reasons. So this, uh, this uh, is very interesting. Yeah. Okay, so now let's turn to the uh, ten minutes left. Uh, let's turn to the log of the out case. Now I started talking about the log of the out case where kx plus v was zero, but that's actually pretty hard to achieve for an arbitrary log of the out because uh, you need it has to be sort of nice well behaved minimal. Uh, so here I'm going to assume pair xd, again, as usual, normal crossings, uh, such that there's a section of omega x twisted by d, so you look at uh, uh, homomorphic forms of uh, allowed to have uh, one pole of omega d, the section of omega x d, which restricts nowhere managing in form on uh, x minus d. So that's going to be my definition of the log of the f. Uh, so one thing that tells us is that in fact the uh, 
canonical class Ax is uh, some summation Ai minus 1 Di, where the Ai is greater equal to 0. Uh, and if all the Ai's were 0, we would be in the situation I started with the beginning of the talk. OK, so we can now go through this construction. Um, and get something. But it's not really the right thing. Uh, and rather what we want to do is we want to restrict attention to <coughs> divisors where AI is zero. So these are in sense divisors you really need to have in, um, in the boundary. The rest you might get just because you scoop them and blow things up. But this is very similar to the, the so-called example of soil and skeleton. So one can find is a subcomplex. Divisors um, di with ai being zero. So we just take that set of rays, the, the subset of rays with the ai's being zero, and then take all of the uh, all of the cones uh, driven by those rays and so So of course this now gives you a submodule. So this is, at uh, first sight, just a submodule of our original Ri. Cool. But you can then show, uh, for just mm -hmm. stupid dimension reasons, that uh, it's actually closed under multiplication. The stupid dimension reasons being that uh, you want to show that these numbers in the Theta are zero if P and Q are B prime, but R isn't B prime. Okay. And that's just mm -hmm. looking at the dimension of the virtual cycle. Uh, okay, so then you define the mirror, uh, the mirror of C. is theory at least in two dimensions which is what we did and it gives up <coughs> some higher dimensions. Okay, I should go after that more but I'm scared of it. <laughs> So that's the uh, log Cobb-Yau case. So what about the Cobb-Yau case? So what's the situation in the Cobb-Yau world where you want to construct mirrors? Well, what you do is you take a maximally unipotent degeneration of Cobb-Yau. S might be, say, the spectrum of the discrete valuation ring. We have the pose point in S, and then we have the primary zero X. We just assume that this is a normal cross-sins degeneration. Uh, we don't assume anything about minimality or relative minimality. Uh, of course, the, uh, the 
generic type, which should be a genuine type. Yeah. And now we apply the previous discussion with a few modifications. I don't want to go into the details of the five previous discussion. Uh, I'm sorry, X. can I? X. X zero. Mark, can I bring you back to that board for yeah. a second? So what happens if there are no divisors with AI equals zero? Um, well, I guess you don't get it. Uh, no, but you get still a mirror, which is a formal object, but over, no, over what? Over not uh, Well, I mean, if there are no divisors to AI is zero, then B is empty, or B is, is zero. Okay. Uh, so yes. So, uh, but what's the mirror? B prime, B prime, sorry, B prime. That's it. So what can we say about the mirror? Uh, well, I, I want to consider ones where um, we really do. So, I mean, to make a precise statement, I should say that to be interesting, B prime has to be a complementary model. Right. Uh, so, you know, typically the way you get this is you would start with an XD, uh, maybe actual minimal, where D is generically reduced, uh, but maybe really awful with DLT singularities, and then you resolve the singularities. Right. So, you have a lot of components which are, uh, are uh, where AI is bigger than zero. But, uh, but so if we start a situation when it's not like that, then you'll still do this degeneration before you can say something interesting That's about right. it. So I'm not obviously here to no. okay. So yeah. for example, you took P1 with a double point. Okay. Uh, that's just not the difference. Okay. So X minus D might have H1, right? Not, not H1. Yeah. So in SH, there is a gradient that we shift that because of the gradient of Can you see that from this point? Um, I haven't thought about that. Okay, anyway, I have a So, yep. uh, so what we do is we apply the discussion to this pair. Now, this is in some sense a lot of You might object to the fact that X is very non-compact, but we're setting a discrete evaluation rate. Uh, but if you focus attention only on curves that uh, map to, to points in, in S, then you can actually go through everything. You have to work uh, not with uh, P as a subset of the homology of X, but Uh, and you end up getting a ring, and then you, instead of taking error, is a prong, not the spectrum prong, or I prime. So the I prime, you should really think of speaking from P is quite a bit in the mirror in this case. And to get that, to get that ring, I guess the box space X and R is enough? Uh, that's right. Okay. Um, so is there like uh, any case when you calculate this and you know it's the right thing? Uh, yeah, so I was going to, my last uh, 10 minutes of the talk, which read, you know, since stock is one minute left to go, was to give an example where we can do all this. Uh, let me just summarize the, the, the key points of the example of my stock. Uh, uh, of course, you know, in practice, uh, if, if you want to do this for Fabio, it's pretty hopeless at the moment. Uh, yeah, there are certain things you can say. It's easy to say what this is to zero order, so you get certain information. But then you're left with guessing what happens when you start with form. Uh, but so here's a very quick example. Uh, let's blow up P1 cross P1 at one point on this band. Uh, so this is very similar to the sort of example Paul was talking about this morning or, or yesterday. Uh, so you blow up that point here on one of the boundary divisors to get a minus one curve. Uh, uh, so let's say this is divided by D1, D2, D3, D4, and the neutralization looks something like this, where the general is P1. Now, it turns out that if you're interested in saying just multiplying, say, theta p1 times theta p2, that just behaves like monomials. So theta p1 and theta p2 is just theta p1 plus p2. 
And that comes from constant maps. Uh, and you have a constant map in that case. For this, you have a constant map on a big point of the curve. Uh, and really, you're just keeping track of some very simple information about the uh, sections of certain line bundles here. So it's very easy to track what was on the line. One such curve, and since that is zero in homology, you end up with something like this. Uh, so a somewhat more interesting calculation is, say, theta p1. Theta p1 times theta p3. Uh, so that means you want to look at curves that are transversal but intersect d1 and transversal but intersect d2. And it turns out that the only possible curve will have r equals 0. r equals 0 means that zr, zr, sorry, zr, uh, is, uh, is the whole space. Uh, so you fix a point in uh, point little z, and then the, the only allowable curve is, uh, is a curve of class d2 or d4. Going right through there, uh, that's just ordinary relative to our wisdom theory. And you get that this is equal to uh, z to the d2. Uh, and then the other uh, equation of interest is theta p2 times theta p4 is equal to theta 3 theta 0. That comes from similar curve curve like that. But there's one more term of plus d to d1, theta p1. And that comes from a curve like this that has point there, point there, tangent to d2, or transversal to d2 to d4, and then one additional point negative order of the intersection uh, with D1, which makes sense because it's a minus one that accounts for the intersection with D1 part. Uh, so that, that's an example. Mm -hmm. More questions? Suppose I wanted like the mirror of the Fermat thing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, uh, how many Gromov wooden invariants do I have to compute to know that I've gotten? I mean, your procedure says there's something to do. Uh, uh, you don't need to know very many in that case uh, for, for sort of stupid reasons. So uh, you know, um, actually, no, that may not be. Yeah, can I do the mirror to the mirror of the Fermat printer? Okay. Well. <laughs> uh, so in that case, you're supposed to get a quick <laughs> Uh, in that case, you know to zero order that's already a printer. And so from general principles of definition, you're going to deform to the uh, So as long as you know that it smooths under the construction, which I think is, is harder, uh, you know you get printed. Uh, but you know, in, in, that's very non-effective. Uh, you know, saying what the equations are. Uh, actually, you can also say what the equations are is if you start with sort of enough symmetry, which you have in that case, the equation, the quintic equation, has to satisfy the same symmetries, and then you find out what it is up to some high level. Were you saying also there's a general expectation that you know the structure of these invariants should tell you automatically that the mirror family is smooth? Or no, so this this is also I mean in general it won't be. Uh, the reason is that there are mirrors of smooth things that aren't smooth. Or I'm just sure. So so there's there's a fundamental question here is you know, Given this construction, can you detect smoothness in some way? And uh, the methods are not good at that. Uh, in particular, when we were dealing with this issue in two dimensions, we did it by reducing to what's called the Seabird situation, where you sort of push all the problems that were happening in the vertex out so that you don't have a local model of the vertex. But that sort of requires going back to the beginning of where we had started. From. This, you can't do that. Uh, and yeah, there are some interesting cases, like the, the example that Paul talked about with the uh, mirror to quartic threefold. Uh, you don't have any ability to do the title. So, it, it's very interesting. But th th there should be some easy way to detect non smoothness, for example, from that picture over there, because the uh, limit of the AIs will typically be non-smooth, so that will cause non-smoothness for the whole mirror, and that you can probably detect easily, right? Uh, well, but yeah, that, I mean, the fact that this is, 
is singular is, is not really interesting. This this is still purely this is really just the completion of the of a torch ride. Uh, but if that's singular, then the, the uh, right, right. But no, I mean, but you know, there are fibers of this that are singular. The, the fiber over the uh, right. over the, the origin here is highly singular, so it's right. quite reducible. Uh, but there's still a notion of uh, uh, of this being sort of a smoothing uh, by the uh, So you, you want to know that the support of the uh, see how does this work? Uh, the, how is that better than me? Uh, you look at the Fitting angle, fitting angle. Uh, and um, you want to know that the, let's say, this work, this ring should not surject from the fitting angle or something like that. It, it's not okay. Um, so, you know, there's some criterion for, for saying that somehow, even though this is formal, and of course it's quite singular, there's some sense in which it is still smoother. Advantage of working in algebraic geometry for having this discussion? Um, I don't know, algebraic geometry. Equivariant localization, I don't know. Pick your favorite. Uh, no, but you know, I think there's still lots of technical issues in, in this symplectic world. I, I mean, but, yeah, you know, like, basically what you're saying is you define some technical quality in an algebraic way and it takes time. It's actually not synthetic. It's, it's not. Well, okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the fact that you can't do it. Let's say analog for now. Yeah. Uh, I sort of think had synthetic homology before. I guess you've taken stack of that. Yeah, and how do you compute it? So how do you compute this? <laughs> well, I mean, in fact, there you are know, many interesting cases we can. There's uh, uh, a number of examples on so two dimensional cases. Uh, there's, there's a lot you can say. And, uh, Maybe the question I sort of meant to ask is, can you compute this by a tropical calculation? Does that follow from your sort of... Uh, so, you know, you, you need some ground wooden input somewhere. So, for example, so I had those steps one, two, and three. I simply am lecturing on three today because that's the thing I can actually get through in that. Really, for me, you know, I want to do steps one and two, too, but it takes more effort to explain that. So you could just start, get the scattering diagram, and then do everything else tropical. Thank you. Uh, but getting the scattering diagram is hard, too. Uh, I have a student who's uh, looking at the rationalistic surface case. Uh, and it seems like getting equations is easier than getting the scattering diagram. So, so is it true that if I could get the scattering diagram symplectically, that it wouldn't matter somehow whether I want to do it up? At the moment I get the scattering diagram, and I convince myself that I can use whatever, then somehow the setup was the same in both, uh, both settings? Do you want to convince yourself or do you want to prove it? Prove it. No, 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 to prove it. If, if you prove that whatever uh, is calculated in the symplectic side by the scattering diagram. Uh, yeah, so th then you, you still, I mean, you have to prove, uh, so, so there's this, uh, a step called, you have to show consistency of the scattering diagram, mm -hmm. which is saying that what you get from these broken lines, from these proper objects, a state of functions is, uh, is actually going to prove the broken mm -hmm. function. So you know, all, all you need is the right sort of gluing properties for whatever symplectic gadgets you, you're using. And yeah, presumably, if you define things correctly, that shouldn't be hard. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then you can turn the crank. So I mean, there's this paper with Paul Wall and Sean Perrin out of uh, the last uh, 100 plus page paper with the one marked out. So it sets up this machine in general. And you just have to put this into uh, the scattering diagram and turn the crank. But we don't say how to do this. Okay. It's, it's a machine. And, and, uh, we can, my claim is we can get the input. I haven't told you how to get the scattering diagram. You need, in our dimensions, you need uh, puncture endurance also. Uh, but it's, it's basically the same idea. Uh, but you know, in these cases, you know, as, as Kenny mentioned, when you have, say, negative self intersection clauses, this is, is quite far from, I mean, you're not going to get, it's not the correct thing for doing linear symmetry in the sense that, well, for example, the Orlando Ginsburg potential, it's not going to be correct to compute. It has to be, be corrected because you're only seeing the, the logarithmic part of the algorithm here, which is not the same as one. Other questions? If not, let's thank Mark again.